Okay, great. So uh, it's great to be here. And this talk, the title of this talk is on efficient zero knowledge proofs, the modular approach. Um, I think that uh, this talk can serve two purposes for those who are not very familiar with how zero knowledge proofs work. It gives a sort of a gentle introduction, kind of abstract and high level, but I think it still conveys uh, the spirit of how the state of the art, most state of the art approaches work and why. And for those who are doing uh, research on, on getting better zero knowledge proofs, uh, I think uh, this talk is a kind of a pitch for uh, taking a certain kind of a modular approach uh, that is already practiced, but I think it should be practiced more often and more systematically. Okay, so I'll soon explain what I mean. Great, so uh, as everybody who is here knows, uh, it, took a long, it took a long time, uh, Shafi mentioned it yesterday, but finally zero knowledge research is really the big party that it ought to be. Uh, this party is driven both by having new techniques for constructing better zero knowledge proofs and also by a really amazing array of new applications that apply to many, a growing number of real world applications. And uh, these are just some of the buzzwords of uh, names of zero knowledge proof systems that we've heard about or we'll hear about uh, later in this workshop. So that's great. But uh, the nature of big parties is that they often lead to a big mess, right? This is a kind of in inevitable uh, byproduct of every good party. And I guess that uh, part of my mission here is to help clean up, partially clean up the mess and maybe make room for a new kind of mess. So towards this end, I'll advocate a, a modular approach whose main uh, goal is to try to maximize the separation between the information theoretic parts of a zero knowledge proof and the cryptographic parts. That's really uh, the main point here. And we have cryptographic compilers to go from the information theoretic part to the final cryptographic zero knowledge proof. And also we have information theoretic compilers that allow us to move between different kinds of information theoretic uh, components. Okay, so to be a bit uh, more concrete, uh, we start with this uh, specification of the zero knowledge functionality, right? So you can take a Python program that specifies what you want to prove in zero knowledge, and our end goal is to come up with an actual zero knowledge protocol that runs, uh, say, interactively, non interactively in the plane model. So, the usual way of uh, making this modular is using uh, this intermediate step where we take a, a high level specification or Python code. And, uh, and represent it using a zero knowledge friendly representation, some kind of computational model that is suited for the efficiency features of the concrete zero knowledge protocol we're employing. So typical examples that we heard about include the different types of circuits, quadratic arithmetic programs and the rank one constraint satisfaction systems. All those are types of representations that are convenient towards expressing zero knowledge functionalities with respect to existing zero knowledge protocols. So typically you would go directly from this representation to a SNARK, okay, or another type of zero knowledge proof system. And the modular approach I'm advocating here introduces this additional intermediate component, which is an information theoretic proof system or zero knowledge PCP for short. Uh, what do I mean by information theoretic? I mainly mean that security properties hold against computationally unbounded parties. This applies both to soundness, so the prover can be computationally unbounded, and to zero knowledge, the verifier can be computationally unbounded, and these properties hold information theoretically against computationally unbounded parties. And typically, but not always, they're also unconditional. They do not need any cryptographic assumptions. Sometimes uh, if we want to squeeze this uh, final uh, drops of efficiency out of it, we can make some combinatorial conjectures but typically these proof systems are also unconditional and certainly they do not rely on cryptographic assumptions. Okay, so at this point it looks a bit abstract and we have different kinds that I'll tell you about in this talk. And then we have a general compiler that uses crypto and cryptographic assumptions, so both tools and assumptions from crypto to convert this information theoretic proof system into an actual zero knowledge proof in the plane model 
Uh, I encourage everyone to go to the breakout session on uh, assumptions, crypto assumptions. This will be discussed extensively. But for now, let's just think of a crypto compiler that takes something that typically holds unconditionally and makes it into an actual protocol you can use by making use of crypto. Great. So I should stress that we have many different kinds of information theoretic proof systems. And we have many different kinds of crypto compilers. And in fact, the same proof system can be combined, can be matched with different compilers. OK, so uh, you can have many different combinations of proof systems, information theoretic proof systems, and crypto compilers. And we also have these information theoretic compilers that allow us to move between different kinds of information theoretic proof systems. And even we can convert different types of cryptographic primitives like information theoretic MPC protocols into information theoretic zero proof systems. And we'll hear about it from Amit uh, later today. Good. So uh, uh, Karmit is happy because uh, Karmit was changed to Amit. <laughs> it's a, it's a small, uh, small eddy distance, yes. Good. So, uh, OK, so why? Why am I advocating this type of modular approach? We have different kinds of modular approaches. So there are generic uh, reasons why modular approach is better in every context, right? If you're doing programming languages, in any, in any kind of context, a modular approach is better. Uh, so the first reason is simplicity. And here I should stress the fact that because we have this information theoretic component that, in a sense, forms the meat of the zero knowledge proof. For this component, you can actually hope to have a tight understanding of its efficiency. It's very difficult to get such a tight understanding for the final cryptographic protocol. But for an information theoretic proof system, we can hope to prove lower bounds. And sometimes failing to prove lower bounds gives us ideas for upper bounds that would have no, we wouldn't have thought of otherwise, right? So being able to kind of systematically study and understand the complexity of this information theoretic component is useful for uh, simplicity, but also uh, for better understanding. There is the advantage of generality that the same components, either the information theoretic proof system or the crypto compiler, can be used in many different ways and for many different applications. And finally, uh, we can use this approach uh, to get better efficiency in many ways. So you can have a GPU implementation of an information theoretic, like a certain kind of zero-knowledge PCP, and then you can compile it in a black box way uh, into a final zero knowledge protocol, whereas if you designed everything from scratch, you could not benefit from an implementation of this uh, information theory component. OK, and I guess that the main point I want to drive through is that uh, this approach really allows us to have a more systematic exploration. We have a huge space of designs, and I think we've only uncovered a very small part of what can be done in the space of efficient zero knowledge proof. So right now, we're all doing all these fine-tuned optimizations of existing approaches. But there are many more approaches to be discovered that are quite different from what we do today. And the way towards discovering these other approaches and systematically even exploring the space of existing approaches is via some kind of a modular approach like the one I'm advocating. Of course, there are also others. Great, so let me uh, try to give some idea of the breadth of the different goals of zero knowledge proofs. Again, it's something we heard about and we'll hear more about. We have many, many different uh, design criteria. Uh, there are these qualitative features, uh, you know, interactive versus non-interactive, succinct versus non-succinct. Do we want the verifier to be super fast or we don't care about it? Do we want verification to be public or we're okay with designated verifier? Is the input public or sometimes encrypted or committed? Is it NP statement or polytime statement, trusted setup or no trusted setup? Are we fine with public key crypto? Are we fine? Do we want post quantum? Right? These are all qualitative features that you know you can check the ones that are important for your specific application, but we need to specify them in order to know which is the best zero knowledge proof system to use. And even if you fully specify all the features on the left that you want. Uh, you still have trade-offs between different efficiency measures. And again, we heard about it yesterday. Uh, communication, how many bits the, proof, uh, the prover needs to communicate. That's the main feature in the non-interactive setting. It's the only feature. You can talk about how complex is the prover in terms of computation, and the same for verification. And in many cases, uh, you know, we care a lot about some features and care less about others. So, you know, 
we've heard about commercialization efforts for zero knowledge. Uh, now we're in the you know, uh, standardization process. This is uh, the main goal uh, we're here for. And so one could hope that all these efforts will lead to uh, something that we will standardize and, uh, as, an optimized, as an optimal zero knowledge protocol that everybody will be using, right? This could be some kind of a dream goal. But of course, uh, it's not something that uh, we can realistically hope for because of the diversity of different goals and the trade-offs between different features. And I want to give you some kind of uh, extreme example of why even if you try to focus to isolate just one feature, which is efficiency of verification, things are much less clear cut than they might seem. So consider two identical SNARKs. They both have the same prover complexity, the same proof size, but they only differ in the cost of verification. In the first SNARK, the verification performs other than some, let's say, linear scan of the input, it performs a single uh, application of SHA-256 hash function. And in the second SNARK, the verifier has to perform the decryption of a standard public key encryption scheme. Okay, so normally, and again, you, if, if this looks too cheap to you, multiply it by a million, you know, this, this, this cost. So normally we would say, hey, the second verifier is much worse than the first verifier, right? By orders of magnitude. However, it turns out that if you consider a specific application of SNARKs that might become a killer up 10 years from now, uh, it's, the opposite is true. So here, uh, you know, consider the goal of general purpose obfuscation. So just to give some background, uh, since 2013, uh, there was a big breakthrough work of Gargetal that introduced for the first time uh, the theoretical possibility of general purpose obfuscation schemes. So you can take a general program and just obfuscate it without any trusted hardware. However, all existing approaches, so, and there's really a lot of research in the theory community on trying to base this general purpose obfuscation on good assumptions and trying to understand it and apply it. However, one really big uh, caveat so far is that uh, we haven't been able to come up with implementable general purpose obfuscation schemes. And one promising approach towards this end is uh, to use the fact that uh, in some sense, SNARK verification is an obfuscation complete task. So the high level idea is that if you have a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, and by now this is standardized, it's getting faster and faster. You can just, the obfuscated code will include a fully homomorphic encryption of your program and an obfuscation of something that performs FHE decryption and SNARK verification. And to run the obfuscated code on your input, you just homomorphically run the encrypted program on your input and then you feed to the obfuscated gadget the encrypted output along with a SNARK that the computation was done correctly. Otherwise, you could run any program or any modified version of the program. Okay, so it turns out that if you can obfuscate, essentially that's, that's really the bottleneck. If you can obfuscate a SNARK verifier, then you could solve general purpose obfuscation. From a practical point of view, I'm not talking here about the question of how to analyze it in which model and so on. And it turns out, and this motivated um, you know, a, a work uh, with Bonessa Hai and uh, Wu, uh, where we try to look at existing general purpose obfuscation schemes and ask ourselves what they're good at. And it turns out that they're good at obfuscating, I mean, this was not new, that uh, the relevant complexity measure is not a circuit size, but it's branching program size. And then it turns out that SHA-256 is terrible in this respect, but if you look at encryption schemes like Regev or lattice-based encryp encryption schemes, their decryption can be performed by reasonably small branching programs. And so it turns out that if you build some lattice-based SNARK, and this was our primary motivation, then you can get much, much better obfuscation of the verifier using existing approaches to obfuscation. So again, by, for now, it's still a borderline implementable, but with new advances in obfuscation, this might become a mainstream approach for general purpose obfuscation. And it illustrates the point that the standard efficiency measures that you have in mind are not relevant to all kinds of applications. Yes? In fact, we can feel this already in recursive optimization. In a one-shot snark, you would rather have certain types of uh, operations in the verifier. But the moment you are sort of verifying the verifier, already you would rather 
Yeah, exactly. Ale made an excellent point that the same issue applies uh, also in previous contexts like recursive composition of SNARKs and, and in others like uh, you can think of distributing the role of a prover not in the sense of yesterday but just you want to sequester the witness and now implement the prover. So there are many, many different scenarios that can motivate very different efficiency features and goals. And that's my main point. That, you know, if you're trying to optimize, you know, a very specific system, it will only be good for one purpose. And you have many more optimization goals that you can even imagine. Okay, so now let me go back uh, to how it all started. Uh, so following, uh, you know, the work of uh, uh, Shafi et al. that uh, introduced the notion of zero-knowledge proofs, uh, we got the first general feasibility result uh, of uh, Goldreich, Mikali, and Wicklerson. We show that if you have a standard primitive of a bit commitment, you can build zero knowledge proofs for all of NP. These proofs are interactive, they're not very efficient, but they're provably secure. And in fact, we can even use uh, the assumption that one way functions exist, and this assumption is in some sense necessary. So this gives us a complete picture about, you know, <laughs> feasibility of zero knowledge and the assumptions that are sufficient for it. And it might lead to the conclusion that the problem is solved. But of course, this is really not the case because these initial constructions were very inefficient, both in terms of rounds and in terms of uh, communication and, and computation. Okay, but let me first, it's useful to see how these initial feasibility results were obtained. By the way, how, how much time do I have? Excellent. Okay, so, let, so, let's, uh, so let's see how, uh, how this uh, initial feasibility result was obtained of Goldreich et al. because it would lead us to the first type of abstraction of an uh, information theoretic proof system. So the high level idea is that we reduce our zero knowledge functionality to an empty complete problem, which is the problem of deciding whether a graph is three colorable, namely whether you can color the nodes of the graph by red, blue, and green, uh, so that no two adjacent nodes have the same color. Okay, so here the prover, the common input is the graph, and the secret witness that the, that the, in, that the prover holds is the coloring of the graph, uh, you know, uh, red, uh, blue, or whatever this is called, cyan. <laughs> okay, so now, the zero knowledge proof works in the following way. First, the prover picks a permutation of the three colors. Say, you know, the blue and cyan, the, the cyan turns to blue, blue to cyan, and red stays red. And now it applies this permutation to recolor the graph. Okay, the prover starts with a valid coloring. If you permute the colors, it's still a valid coloring. Now the prover generates a separate commitment for every node of the graph and sends to the verifier. So this commitment is kind of like a locked box holding this color, which the verifier does not have access to unless the prover opens it. And of course, it's implemented using cryptographic assumptions such as one-way functions. Now the verifier challenges the prover to open a random edge, so a random pair of uh, boxes or envelopes that are connected by an edge. The prover has to comply or else the proof is rejected. And then the verifier rejects if the colors are the same because then it means that it's not a proper coloring. And otherwise you need to repeat uh, many times, at least as many as the number of edges to get a reasonable level of soundness. Okay, so this is how the GMW zero knowledge protocol uh, works. And um, it's very elegant. However, if you try to prove security, you know, look at uh, Goldrack's book, Foundations of Cryptography, it will be like a couple of uh, technical pages to prove that this protocol indeed satisfies the intuitive security property. Right, and now suppose that we use a different NP-complete uh, language like Hamiltonicity, do we need to redo the proof from scratch, right? It's not trivial at all. And also, and the main point uh, that makes us currently unhappy about it is efficiency. And here you have two sources of inefficiency. One is the need to reduce your functionality to the three coloring problem, which is non-trivial and expensive. And the other is to need to amplify soundness. So this has cost both in communication and in rounds. Parallel repetition will not work uh, in the plain model. Okay, so here I'm introducing the first kind of abstraction that kind of distills the information theoretic component from this zero knowledge proof system. 
Okay, so this is the abstraction that will uh, help us in some way. And this is the simplest kind of zero knowledge PCP. You can just look at what the prover produces as a string over some finite alphabet, string pi. It's probabilistically generated by the prover given the input and the witness. So in this case, pi will just be the color of each node that's been committed to after the permutation uh, is applied. And now the verifier just, uh, just makes randomized point queries to this proof string. So it reads some randomly chosen subset of the symbols and decides whether to accept and reject. Okay, so I hope the syntax of this proof system is clear. Note that it has a very simple security definition. Uh, you know, everything here is information theoretic, you know, completeness. It's perfectly zero knowledge. It's even public coin. Uh, you can analyze the soundness error precisely. You know, it's not uh, negligible, whatever you can analyze, right? You can repeat it if you want to amplify soundness. So if you want to amplify soundness, you just uh, have independent copies of pi and independent queries, and you can see that soundness amplifies the way you expect it. So everything here is very simple and clean. You can analyze it exactly using a small proof, a short proof. And you can even talk about efficiency measures uh, in a very precise way, right? We can talk about, uh, can we use a similar proof over a smaller alphabet? Or do we gain something by increasing the alphabet size? How many queries do we need? What is the trade-off between soundness and queries and alphabet size? So now you can ask all these very precise questions about different efficiency measures. And finally, you can abstract the difficult part of the GMW zero-knowledge proof as a crypto compiler that takes any such zero-knowledge PCP and compiles it into an actual zero-knowledge proof in the plain model. And you have different types of compilers in the literature depending on whether you want constant rounds or not, whether you're happy with computational soundness or not. And you have, uh, say, in the random oracle model, you have the fiat Shamir heuristic that gives us non-interactive zero knowledge in the random oracle model. Or you can use an alternative, uh, which is the traditional complexity-based NIZK, which works in the CRS model. And there you typically start with a different kind of a proof system, which is not zero knowledge PCP. But let's go back to the zero knowledge PCP abstraction and ask the following questions. Can we improve the parameters of this recolorability-based construction? And you know something that might seem uh, not really a, a worthy goal, certainly when we popularize our research, we want it to look as magical as possible. But when we're trying to understand it, we want it to be uh, you know, less magical. So can we do something that will not rely on the miracle of having an NP-complete language that happens to have this convenient structure? Okay, it seems kind of magical. The trick colorability is NP-complete, and this permutation trick works for it. Okay, so this uh, leads me to this uh, first example of information theoretic compiler that takes simple MPC protocols and converts them into zero-knowledge PCPs. This will be the topic of uh, a mid talk. I will not uh, elaborate. Let me just say that now you can take very simple zero-knowledge, uh, sorry, the very simple MPC protocols, say, uh, you know, the BGW protocol in the honest majority setting, or the GMW protocol using ideal OT uh, in the setting of no honest majority. And you can apply an information theoretic compiler, a sort of MPC in the head, uh, to make them into zero knowledge PCPs, which can later be compiled into actual zero knowledge protocols. OK, and these are not just, uh, you know, initially this was done in the context of a theory work. We were trying to get all kinds of asymptotic efficiency uh, corollaries. But it turns out to even be useful for practical purposes. And you have uh, zero-knowledge proof systems like ZKBU uh, you know, and, and others that are linear. They're not sublinear. They're not succinct. But for small circuits, they sometimes have uh, efficiency advantages over other approaches. And they even lead to some practical uh, candidate for a post-quantum signature scheme. And it turns out, somewhat surprisingly, that you can use, even though MPC protocols, the communication complexity is always bigger than the circuit size, it turns out that if you balance the number of parties uh, and the circuit size appropriately, you can get uh, all the way to square root and circuit size. And this is the Ligero uh, protocol uh, work with uh, Scott Ames, Karmit, and Mutu, uh, where we show lightweight and setup-free uh, uh, you can think of it as setup free uh, proof system or SNARKs uh, that use only symmetric crypto 
and uh, are very simple to describe and implement. So Amit will give uh, more information about this zero knowledge uh, in the head approach, the MPC in the head approach. Okay, so in the rest of the, how much time? Ten? Okay, in the six remaining minutes, I want to give you a brief overview of how we get full succinctness. Namely, we make the proof size polylogarithmic or even uh, what people refer to as constant. Great, so recall the traditional notion of probabilistically checkable proofs. It's an alternative to the standard notion of proofs which are very painful to verify. PCPs have this magical property. Now forget about zero knowledge, it's just a proof. You want to have a proof of a mathematical theorem or some other statement. And PCPs have the magical property that you can verify them uh, with very high uh, level of soundness by reading just a small number of bits from the proof. Okay, so this is the, these are really amazing results. Uh, some of the highlights of research of theoretical computer science started from the notion, actually it started from the same paper that introduced zero knowledge uh, that led to uh, this amazing concept of PCPs. And it turns out that you can make, so PCPs do not talk explicitly about zero knowledge, but you can convert them generically into zero knowledge PCPs in the sense that I defined before. Uh, with a small overhead. So what's the difference between this and the three colorability? The three colorability has very poor soundness. You need to repeat it many times, and if you repeat it many times, then you no longer read few symbols of the proof. Here you really re read 100 bits from the proof that are chosen at random, and you're convinced that the statement is correct. So this is really this notion of PCPs. If you want to convert zero-knowledge PCPs directly into zero-knowledge proofs that maintain their efficiency features, the naive approach does not work. So the naive approach would be, let the verifier send to the prover the bits, the indices of the bits that he wants from the proof, and let the prover send uh, the verifier these bits. This violates soundness because soundness cru crucially relies on independence between the proof and the queries. And once the prover can see the queries, uh, it can concoct uh, answers that will violate soundness. But it turns out that here you have a fairly simple crypto compiler that takes such classical PCPs and converts them into uh, zero knowledge arguments, succinct zero knowledge arguments. The idea is based on Merkle trees. We've heard about it from Nick yesterday, but essentially you take, you put uh, the bits of the proof in the leaves of a Merkle tree. Um, the prover sends uh, the commitment, the root of the tree, it's very short. And now the verifier tells the prover, hey, please open uh, bits number seven, 14 and 28 and the prover just needs to send a path from the leaf to the root along with the sibling, so that's quite succinct. And however, even though in theory people seem, it seemed like this gives us everything we want in terms of efficiency, when you look at it, it has several sources of redundancy. So first, you're taking this sweetness, you're applying this PCP encoding, right, which is a very complex thing, now you're compressing it using crypto to a short thing. So there is a redundancy of first expanding a lot and then compressing, right? Maybe we can do, maybe we can have a computational shortcut. Okay, this PCP encoding is very heavy computationally and it's also, this approach is suboptimally succinct. Let me say briefly that you have two sources of overhead. One is sound simplification because these PCPs, you cannot get good soundness with a small number of queries, so you need to have many queries for good soundness. And a second source of inefficiency is this uh, log depth uh, path of a Merkle tree. So if you're shooting for the type of succinctness that in yesterday's talks of the ZK snarks based on pairings, you cannot get it using this approach, except that we have some recent proposals by uh, Liu and Molovolta and by Bonet al that uh, g use a stronger crypto gadget than a Merkle tree. Think of it as a way of committing to a vector in a way that allows you to open selectively some bits of this vector. So this does in principle allow us to get close to the level of succinctness of these uh, pairing based narcs. However, it makes the computational cost even worse. Okay, so this approach, the limitations are computational, computational it's computationally heavy on the prover side and it's not as succinct as we want it to be. 
Okay, so the first type of relaxation, and again, I will just mention it briefly because Nick talked about it yesterday. Uh, it's allowing uh, interactions. So now the prover can send multiple PCPs where each PCP is determined by public coins uh, or challenges uh, that are issued by the verifier, or uh, we can use uh, Fiat Shamir to make it non-interactive. And it turns out that this type of relaxation helps make the prover work smaller. So it takes care of uh, the problem, the first problem I mentioned of computationally heavy prover, but still uh, we have the succinctness problem. Okay, and this was introduced first in the context of interactive PCP by Kalai and Raz, and later the notion of IOP by uh, Ben Sasson, Kies, and Spooner, and uh, Rangel, Rothroom, and Rothroom. Okay, the, the second type of relaxation, and I will only be brief, but this is really what uh, underlies uh, these uh, super succinct and efficiently verifiable pairing-based NARCs, uh, is to relax the type of queries that the verifier can make from point queries, namely reading individual symbols, to linear queries, which take an inner product of the proof vector with a query vector. So now think of the proof not as a string over an alphabet, but as a vector over a big finite field. And think of every query of the verifier as specifying some linear combination of the entries of the proof pi. Okay, so this is called the linear PCP. It defines just like standard PCP. So the verifier gets answers and based on these answers and the input decides whether to accept or reject. And it turns out that this type of relaxation of allowing linear queries has multiple advantages. First, it's simple, you can get, I can give you in two minutes a PCP for NP with just three or four queries. It's called the Hadamard PCP, okay? So it's really simple. Uh, we can get such linear PCPs uh, that are short and efficiently computable. I should mention the breakthrough work of uh, uh, Gennaro Gentry, Parno, and Rykova that uh, gave the first construction of uh, linear size uh, linear PCPs. We can get a good soundness error, like one over field size with just a small number of queries. I should mention that in a, in a work uh, uh, with uh, Bitansky, uh, Kiesa, Swarovski, and Panev, we show that even one query is enough with some caveats. So in principle, we can get a single ciphertext snarks, at this point only in the designated verifier setting. And finally, and let me jump uh, forward, uh, we can compile them into actual snarks. It's easier in the designated verifier setting. There we can essentially use any homomorphic encryption scheme that's, that offers a kind of a targeted malleability. And if we have pairings, then we can basically perform the verification on encrypted queries. That's the underlying idea. And again, I'm out of time, so I will not describe the details. Uh, you can look a uh, video presentation of a similar talk in the Bar Ilan uh, workshop uh, for the details of this approach. Let me just uh, conclude by saying that uh, we can also combine uh, interactive interaction with linearity and consider a notion of um, inter sorry of interactive uh, linear PCPs. And this is a good abstraction of the things Yael will talk about. So you can consider proof systems, interactive proof systems, such as uh, Goldwasser, Kalai, and Rothblum, and the uh, RRR, as interactive linear PCPs, or sorry, inter or linear IOPs, uh, which can be compiled, and uh, we've seen some systems like Hyrax and others can be compiled into actual very efficient zero-knowledge proof systems. So let me conclude, and uh, you know, there is a new notion of fully linear PCPs and IOPs in a joint work with Bonnet, Al, and so on. Okay, so let me conclude uh, that we have these different types of information theoretic PC proof systems or zero knowledge PCPs. We have four main types depending on the type of queries you make, point queries versus linear queries, whether you allow them to be interactive or not. Uh, you can cast most but not all zero-knowledge proofs from the literature into this framework, like an information theoretic proof system and the general crypto compiler. In some sense, there is a result of uh, Rothblum and Vadhan that shows that any construction that makes a black box use of crypto or even works in cond unconditionally in a generic model uh, implies an information theoretic proof system of the types that I described. Uh, but it doesn't apply to black box, non black box constructions like the things that Ale mentioned before. And finally, I would like to say that uh, we have really lots of room 
for improvement and better understanding of these information theoretic proof systems and the crypto compilers. So we can improve both the PCPs and the crypto compilers and separating between the two is the first step towards these types of improvements. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you.